I just, I, Louise, I don't think they need us today. <laughs> Let's just sit and listen, yes? Um, it is good to be together and to worship and to gather. This month, I, this is the 117th day of December, and um, I just <laughs> have to say, um, it, what a time. What a, the Advent is just one of those seasons. We have been given this time to prepare and to worship, and yet life doesn't stop, right? And all the, all the stuff in the world around us and plans and times with holidays can really just overwhelm us. And so what a gift this time is that we can be together and pause and listen and worship in Jesus' name, amen. If you are visiting with us this morning, a special welcome to you. We do have connect cards in the pews in front of you, and that's a great place for you to put your information so that we can reach out to you in the week ahead and just thank you for worshiping with us and see if you have any questions about what it is to follow Christ here at Foundry. As we get closer and closer to Christmas Eve, there is a ton of stuff on the website for you to take a look at, including Christmas Eve service times, uh, service times for our traveler service and our silent night service. All those things we'll talk about a little bit in the, the news today as well. But definitely check in at the website because it's a great place um, to find information. In addition to that, we're going to highlight a few things this morning to just um, to remind you about what's going on in the life of the church outside of worship. So take a look. Hey friends, Christmas is one of our favorite times of year and we're planning again for great celebrations on December 24th, Christmas Eve. I hope you'll come celebrate, invite your friends and your neighbors to join us. Uh, but today, let me take a minute just to lift up two other options. First, on Sunday, December 17th at 5 p.m. at the Jones Road campus in the sanctuary, we'll be hosting a special silent night service. We, we call it a service of hope and healing. And during this service, we just acknowledge that some of us in this holiday season, it can be a difficult time. So if you're grieving a loss of any kind, this is a time to worship, but maybe in a little bit lower key, to light candles together and to remember the quiet hope that Jesus offers. Or maybe you have travel plans that prevent you from joining your Foundry family on Christmas Eve. We're planning something new this year, and I named this the Traveler Service. It will be like our Christmas Eve services, but it will happen a few days early. So hopefully you can worship with us before you head out of town for Christmas. This service is gonna be at the Fry Road campus on Thursday evening, December 21st at 7 p.m. Uh, whenever you can make it, please come and bring friends and we look forward to celebrating Jesus' birth with you. Good morning, Foundry family. We're so excited that today is the day of our service, The Way to the Manger, our family Christmas event. It starts at four o'clock at the Fry Road campus. It's not too late for you to come and just join us. It's going to be an incredible time that you are not going to want to miss as you get your family gathered together to really kick off the Christmas season and do it in a special way that your family is not going to want to miss. We can't wait to see you this afternoon at four o'clock. These past few years have brought many challenges, not just for Foundry, but for our community and our country. But they've also brought so many opportunities, opportunities to see God at work, to witness his faithfulness and his provision, opportunities to witness lives changed, healing, hope, and restoration. Now it's time to celebrate the goodness of God. We wanna invite you to join us for a celebration concert on January 19th featuring the worship group Leland. Invite friends and family to celebrate with us through music, prayer, and more. Concert begins at 7 p.m. with the doors opening at 5.30 for a pre-concert reception. Tickets go on sale December 19th and all proceeds will benefit our mission partner, Compassion International.
Tickets would make a great Christmas gift for anyone who loves a party or anyone who just could use a little hope and joy to start the year. Find all details at foundrychurch.org slash concert. Something exciting to look forward to in the new year. Um, I also will just mention, you may have noticed the poinsettias are with us this week. Hallelujah, they are here. Um, they beautify our space during this Christmas season, and often they are given in um, honor or remembrance of a loved one. There is still an opportunity to purchase one, and uh, in honor or, or uh, memory of a loved one, you can find that information on the website, or we have a QR code just out here in the hallway. Um, and then on Christmas Eve, when our services are over, you're welcome to take the flower our home with you and continue to enjoy it there. Would you stand with me now as we turn to these words from John 17? Lord, sanctify us by your truth, for your word is truth. As you sent Christ into the world, Jesus has sent us into the world. Jesus Christ has made the Father known to us and will continue to make you known. Let the love you have for your son be in us and that Jesus Christ may be in us. Heavenly Father, God, we give you thanks that you have gathered us in this place this morning. We give you thanks, Lord, for your spirit that has been waiting for us long before we arrived. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would fall upon each person here this morning. That as we hear your word, as we sing these songs, as we consider together what you have called for us to do and to be as a church, Lord, that you would fill us with your love and your peace. That this time would be a remembrance for us that you have come to make a way for each one of us and that you will come again. Lord, let, us, let our worship come from a place of deep gratitude for that this morning as we seek your face and to hear your voice today. In Jesus' most holy name we pray, amen. amen. Let us continue to seek God's voice as we sing together.
one in the second weekend of Advent, we turn to the tradition of our Advent candle, where we light these candles around this wreath each weekend, reminding us that Christ has come as the hope of the world. And today, we light the candle of peace to remind us that he is the peace of the world. Bren is one of our confirmation students, and so it is ex especially um, special for her to read and, got, and lead us today. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 5. A voice of one calling in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in, a, in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up and every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all the people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. As Bren lights the candle of peace this morning, we are reminded of Christ's words, that he offers peace not as the world offers it, but as he brings it. And so we, we receive Christ, knowing that he has come to be our peace, and that until he comes again, he will continue to be our peace. Let us continue to pray for God's peace as we sing together. Very good. Friends, there's so much to celebrate this time of year with special events like our concert last Sunday, uh, which was just a fabulous time together and just uh, ushered in the spirit of the season. Um, baptisms, every week it seems like we're having more and more baptisms. So much to celebrate. Uh, I want to just thank you for the ways that you give to God's work at Foundry as we pause each week and reflect on our partnership in that way. Um, we do rely on year-end giving for a big portion of our budget, and we want to finish this year in a strong place financially. So I just wanna ask you and encourage you to remember Foundry as you make those plans to give at the end of the year. Um, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the ways you give, and uh, may God continue to do his work here of helping people know, follow, and share Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the ways that you provide for our needs for the ways that this season reminds us of the greatest gift of all. And I pray, God, that you would take our gifts and our whole lives, use them for your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Will you stand with me as we turn to God's word? In the book of John, at chapter one, beginning at verse nine. For the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world made, was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, we continue to gather in your presence and your light this morning as we pray. And Lord, we lift up those things in our lives that could stand a measure of your peace today. We pray peace over disease and physical ailment, God, and we ask for your healing. We we pray peace over worry and distraction and anxiety, Lord, and we ask for your comfort. We pray peace over situations and circumstances of great need, Lord, and we ask for your provision. And as we prepare to receive your word this morning, your message, I pray peace over hearts and minds. That what tempts us to be distracted, what tempts our focus away from you, would instead seek your face, your voice, and your heart for mankind. Lord, let this be our prayer as we pray together as one, the way that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Have you ever wondered what God looks like? Have you ever just really wanted to see God in any shape, way, or form? Anybody? And you wonder what that is. Like, what questions came to mind? Like, I remember wondering as a child, does he have a beard? Does he look like Gandalf in Lord of the Rings? Does he look like Morgan Freeman? Maybe, I don't know. Is he always dressed in white? Does every time he smile, you hear a little ding sound echoing through heaven when he does that? What is God like? See, I think within all of us, with all, all of our humanity, given that we are created by God, that we want to know our creator. And I think it's so much more than just this idea of who's in charge, as in Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz looking behind the curtain. This idea of seeing God in scripture denotes a, a relationship, a closeness, a proximity of sorts, and an intimacy. 
After God led the people of Israel from Egypt's captivity, he gave them specific instructions to build a tabernacle in the desert, in the wilderness. And the tabernacle was to be considered a sanctuary, a house where the presence of God would reside. But before the tabernacle was built, Moses had set up a little tent away, a tent of meeting, and this is where he would go and meet with God. And as Moses went into this tent, a pillar or a cloud would come upon this tent and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke to Moses. And the folks could see his tent from a distance, so they would have to stay at the entrance of their tents, respectively, and would pray and worship until it was all over. And scripture says that the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Now this phrase, face to face, denotes closeness. It's not literally face to face as you and I would say that here today. But further, because further down in the chapter, Moses says to God, now show me your glory. And God's response to this is, is, is interesting. The Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. So the expression found before face to face is this idea of closeness. But when Moses is asking God, requesting of God to see his glory, he's wanting to see something more. He is wanting to see his very countenance. And God says, I will give you the best that I can, but you're not going to see my face or you're going to die. So even Moses, who spoke closely to God, desired to see him at some level. So after Moses constructed a tabernacle that was given to him in very specific instructions. It says that the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now this is an image of God indwelling within the people of God. In essence, the tabernacle is the dwelling place of God's presence among his people, but it pointed to something so much greater than that. God wanted to be in the midst of his people, and the tabernacle became a visual of how God would be in relationship, not just with Israel, but really for the entire world. Remember, salvation comes to the world through the people of Israel. Now, God has a way of taking the visible things to teach us invisible truths, and I believe the tabernacle is one of them. In this case, the tabernacle was beautiful and powerful and a tangible reminder for the people of Israel of God's desire to be with them. And I think in many ways, it's also a reflection of how they wanted to see God in some fashion. See, the tabernacle was an image of hope and salvation for the entire world. The tabernacle was pointing to something greater. Remember, everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus. And everything in the New Testament is about Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 and 12, it says, But when Christ came as high priest of, of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, it is not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. And jumping to verse 24, that same chapter. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Now, this, this whole idea of tabernacle is God's sanctuary, but it's also denoting for us, as I've mentioned a couple times already, this dwelling place for God. See, everything about the tabernacle pointed to God's plan of reconciliation in this world. Everything from the actual spaces, the furniture, the colors, the cardinal directions in which things faced, the activities that took place within the tabernacle, everything pointing ultimately to the person of Jesus Christ and fulfilled fully in Christ. See, the tabernacle was set up in such a manner that it became a template for the future temple. It's also important to know that the tabernacle was an image of the original garden, the Garden of Eden. And after this temple, 
that existed in Jerusalem. Ultimately, there's going to be a garden that's inst instituted again. But I want us for right now to simply focus on this idea of the tabernacle and how it plays into our lives today. In other words, since the inception of Israel as a people, as God's people, the tabernacle has been the backdrop for their relationship with God. So in broad strokes, this is how the tabernacle and the temple for that matter was laid out. There is only one gate into this tabernacle and that gate led into the outer court of the tabernacle and in many ways that outer court pointed to the fact that salvation was available to the entire world. All were welcomed into that outer court even later in the temple, you hear about the Gentiles had their own spaces. You had men that gathered in certain areas. You also had the women that would gather in certain areas. There was room for everyone in the outer courts. The outer court contained a brazen altar and a laver where the sacrifices would take place. The laver where the priest would come and wash before he went into the other area. But the focus of this outer court was this idea that dealt with sacrifice and judgment and cleansing and as one keeps moving through this tabernacle, we move into an area called the holy place. And to get into that holy place, there is a doorway you must cross to get in there. But only priests could get in there. Again, they had to wash their hands before they made themselves into this area. Now, this area had very little to do with judgment and sacrifice. You've passed all that. And when you walk into this area, it's believed that on one side you would have the candles a menorah of seven lights that was to be lit all the time, which is where Jesus also says, I am the light of the world. This is what they were referring to, what they would make reference to when Jesus said this statement. Then there is a, a table of bread. So when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, they're understanding that, that this is the provision, their sustenance for their journey. There's also a little altar of incense before you go beyond a veil. And this is reminding them that God is their intercessor, also reminding us of our need to pray. This was at the backdrop of everything for the Jewish people at this time. And this place, this holy place is a place of sanctification. I think in many ways, this is where things in us come to die. This is where we shed certain attitudes and mindsets and things that are not of God and begins to work and purify us in a, a different way. This is what we Wesleyans call sanctification, holiness. And lastly, as you keep walking through this holy place, you come to this veil. And once you cross that veil, you've entered into the holy of holies. This is where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And only the high priest could enter into this special sacred space once a year on the Day of Atonement. So if the priest was in there and he forgot his phone, it was going to be one year later till he could go back in there and get his phone. Tough cookies. Like he couldn't just go back in there like, oh, real quick. Very strict rules on how this happened. But when you entered in that place, you were now in that very dwelling place of God's glory. The closest we could see his face. See, these images are ingrained into the people of Israel. And here's the cool thing about this. This is how it's set up if you were to draw a diagram of this. Is the gate into the tabernacle was known as the way. And the doorway into the holy place is known as the truth. And the veil into the holy of holies was referred to as the life. So when Jesus is with his disciples... And he makes this statement, this is what they're understanding. There is a progression in our relationship with Christ. That yes, he is the way to the Father. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. It clicks for the people around him. They're making reference to the temple during Jesus' time. And even one of Jesus' disciples states that he too wants to see God. So after Jesus had washed their feet in preparation to going to the Garden of Gethsemane and before he's taken to be crucified, he is reminding them that he is leaving them, that he is going to prepare a place for them. This image of, of holy hospitality for them continues. And he says in, I forgot what chapter, 
14, verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Think about their minds being blown at this, at this juncture because they have, are longing to see the living, almighty, sovereign God, and Jesus saying, I am he. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Like, ah, maybe he's drank a little too much wine. But I don't know if he understands what he's saying, because we just like to see the Father. It sounds in innocent enough. I mean, Jesus, let us just make it easy for everyone. Show us the Father, and we can all go home. If you got a selfie, that would be great. Maybe we could FaceTime him right now. Maybe you should have invited him over to the disciple dinner we just had. That would have been great. Another one, it would have been that hard because then we all would have been truly convinced had we just seen the Father. And in verse 9, Jesus says, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? These are powerful words. You want to see God? Look at Jesus. Our God is not a God who is hiding or who is invisible and remains unseen. He is a God who has been revealing himself all throughout human history in so many different ways, culminating in the person of Jesus Christ. This is the greatest story of all time. This is what we celebrate leading up to Christmas and on Christmas Day. The creator steps into the story and takes a lead role. The invisible God makes himself visible. This is where the author becomes the protagonist. This is the story of not only Christmas, but this is our story as human beings. The Old and New Testaments all culminate in Christ. Jesus is the human face of God here on earth. Jesus is the way to the Father. This way is the way of truth and of life. Many commentators agree that the statements of truth and life really modify the way. They're describing the kind of way that it is. So after Moses built a tabernacle according to God's specifications, the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. This was a picture of God dwelling with his people. And when Jesus appeared on earth, he tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory. He was the fulfillment of the earthly tabernacle and the glory that rested upon it. This is the crescendo of Christmas for us. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of truth, of grace and truth. See, not only is Jesus the way to the Father, but Jesus is the Father's way to us. A God seeking his creation, wanting to reveal himself over and over, his character, his love, his peace, his power, his provision, his healing, his freedom. And he says, if you trust me, would you come and follow me? Even the law that was given to the people of Israel pointed to something greater. The law could not save us. Human perfection cannot save us, cannot rescue us cannot heal us. As we prepare our hearts for Christmas, I think it's good for us to, to keep in mind that salvation is and always has been God's idea. It hasn't been ours. The ultimate remedy for this world is Jesus Christ. Of 
Christmas is an invitation into this way. But here's that thing. Here's the thing. We don't stop at the gate. Ricky, I wonder if we could put that full picture back up for a second. Thanks, bud. I think many times we get into that outer court and we're just good because we're on the way. We made it. And we're here. And we're hanging out. And many of us just stay in that relationship with Christ where we're constantly asking for forgiveness and the sacrifices and cleansing ourselves because we've screwed up so badly and we stay there with shame and guilt and everything else. But he's calling us into a way of truth. See, us coming to Christ into the way is simply the beginning. It's a life that unfolds in how we live our life out with Christ and the Spirit in us. Ultimately, the Spirit of God dwelling in us. But he invites us into this journey into the holy place to enter in through the truth so that we can be purified, that we will be sanctified. And I think sometimes when we think of this idea of truth, we think of it in contrast to whether this is true or false or this is a truth or this is a lie. And some of us have been thinking about truth by way of facts. And if it's factual, then it must be true. For instance, C.J. Shroud has thrown, Stroud has thrown how much? How many yards? Over 3,500 yards, 20 touchdowns already this season. Hopefully some more today. That's a fact. We'll say that's true. People never say amen, just said amen. <laughs> a side note. Facts are not equivalent to truth. Truth is something that stands beyond the facts of our lives. For instance, you may have encountered a fact right now that is difficult for you to deal with. I'm going through a divorce, I just lost my job, I just got a diagnosis. I'm having trouble right now, whatever it may be. I'm doing well right now. That may be a fact of your life right now, but it's not the truth about who you are or about who God is. God is outside of that. So this idea of truth really describes God, and this is how the Old Testament viewed it. The truth is that God is good and that he's steadfast and constant and caring and slow to anger and merciful and full of grace and full of power. See, truth was used to describe God. Very seldom was it used to describe human beings. So when we're asked to enter into truth, we're asking to enter into a person. See, that's what Jesus' statement utilizing a reference ascribed to himself as God is huge. When he used this phrase, I am, it came from this expression, I am the great I am. And this came when Moses was deliberating with God about how he should tell the people in Egypt who sent me. He goes, I can't just play the God card because God told me to show up. They're supposed to believe it. It may work in little churches all the time. God said it. We must believe it. But God, I need something more than that. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelite. I am has sent me to you. It's a mic drop. The way to the Father leads to truth, allowing us to experience life and life in abundance. I cannot experience the full indwelling of the Father unless I go through his truth. The truth has and was described, I think for us, a different way of being present in, in this world. When we enter into truth, we're able to identify the lies in our lives that we have believed that have kept us, kept us in our own shackles, that kept us in the shadows. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. And we're instructed to live out the truth. This idea of living without sin. We are to love with actions and truth. The terminology of truth is something that the Apostle John used a lot in his writings. As children of God, as people living between the two advents that Jesus came first as a child. And yet we also live expecting him to return again 
And this is what this idea of Advent is, in this waiting. Waiting for God to show up. But in this, we're also led by the spirit of truth. And he will guide us into all truth, scripture says. See, at one point, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I think we misquote this sometimes because we say the truth will set you free. You said this? The truth will set you free. No, it says that knowing the truth will set you free. Not the truth itself. In many ways, yet that's true-ish. But if you pay attention, it's saying the knowledge, the the intimate knowing of the truth is what sets us free as we progress from the way into the truth. It's freedom from sin and death, but also to all kinds of freedom in our lives. And the truth has the power to permeate in the matter in which you and I yield every area of our lives. As the Spirit guides us, we are sanctified by the truth. He says, for your word is truth. See, this was Jesus' prayer and desire in John 17. In other words, God desires to do a deep and lasting work in us. And that is only through the person and power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, which ultimately allows this idea of Emmanuel, God with us, God incarnate, being present fully with us, which we sing about and we long for. We say, God, I want to see you. He says, I have revealed myself to you. See, in the tabernacle, the outer court dealt with atonement and forgiveness of sin. But our relationship with Christ is so much more. He is longing for intimacy and connection with us. Back then, only the priest could enter in. In Christ, there is now a nation of priests who could enter in the holy place. And that is us. If I were to say how many priests in the house, I think some of us would have a really difficult time Like, we're not Catholic or Episcopal. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. It's this idea of what they were supposed to do, of what they were supposed to steward. Matter of fact, in the garden, the words given to Adam and Eve were priestly words, covenantal words, of how they were to tend and keep the garden. Same words given to priests and what their function is to be in the temple and extended to us in our relationship with God as well. When the priest would enter into that holy place, this became a place of worship. When they crossed that threshold, that doorway of truth, then suddenly worship was unleashed within them. See, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. We're to worship God in truth. We're to praise and adore him for what he's done, for who he is, That's why Advent is not just about the nostalgia of some baby being born way back then. It's about preparing our hearts and our minds to worship the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Savior of the world, the deliverer of our souls. That's what we do in preparation for Christmas. That's what we do in Christmas. So I ask again, do you really want to see God? Are you just content with the memories? Are you just content with the stories? Or is there maybe a part of you that is really longing to see God? Maybe in a way you've never seen him before. Because in the story, Jesus becomes one of us. See, the tabernacle points to the truth the truth comes to us in Christ Jesus. And it requires a personal encounter. This is something you're going to get by simply coming here. I would venture to say, maybe even in smaller groups. 
or through some family tradition. Is do you want to see God? Do you want to see God? Do you want to see God? Because let me tell you this, God sees you. Every part of you. He sees the duplicitous, broken part of you, the dark part of you, the broken heart part of you, the hurt part of you, the skeptical part of you. He sees you. And you might be hanging around the way, but he's saying, I want you to draw closer into truth. And when I'm talking about worshiping, I'm not just talking about singing, though that's the key part in many ways. It's about surrendering our lives to the way. The greatest act of worship is our lives. May this morning be a great place for you to say, Holy Spirit, would you lead me? Show me. Let me tell you, that's a bold prayer because the Spirit will respond. I don't know how he will in your life, but I'm telling you, he will respond. We will see God. We will see his glory in our midst. He will use it all for our good and for his glory. He's saying, would you trust me now? And this is the advent we're in right now. That we continue to wait for God to show up in our lives. Some of us have been waiting for a long time. And maybe today is that day where God shows up in a different kind of way. Because I know some of you are longing to see God in specific areas in your life. I want to encourage you not to lose hope. Have the courage to keep asking God, would you show up here? In a broken relationship. In a bad diagnosis. Coming to the end of something. God, would you show up? Here's what we want God to show up, but I also wonder the inverse too. Maybe ask God, God, where do you want to show up in my life? Because we tend to come to God with what we want. Let's do that open handedly, humbly. But that God would give us eyes to see and ears to hear when he says, well, here's where I want to show up in your life. See what he may do. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your goodness, for your power, for your persistence of always coming toward us. Lord, we thank you that you've made a way to the Father, that you've made your way toward us. But Lord, we long to see you. And as a result of having an encounter with you, of seeing you, Lord, I know that we will be changed. We'll be transformed at some level. Some things are really difficult for us. But Lord, you provided a way, a way of grace for us to move forward. So I pray for us to enter into that to that holy of holies where we're sanctified, made made more and more into your image, into your likeness. So we offer ourselves up to you in praise, in worship for what you've done, for the way that you've provided for us to come to the Father. And I wonder as, as we close our time together, if there's a if there's a request and you're saying, I want God to show up in my life, and you know the area, would you simply raise your hand where you are? Is that need God to show up here? With its work and your health, let me you see your hands up high. God, many of us holding up our hands in faith for you to show up because we need you. Though this is a cry of dependence, of need. Well, we know that you listen to us, that you hear us, that you know us, you see us, but you also take action. As you do, Lord, would you be gentle with us?
you reveal yourself in these situations? In the other situations where you want to reveal yourself to us, would you show us? Give us the humility to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wherever you are, whether you're just hanging out in the way or you've been wrestling in the truth for a while, my, my prayer and hope is that for every single one of us to have a personal encounter with the living Christ and experience the indwelling of the Spirit. If in the weeks to come and this morning you're like, man, I, I want to know more about that, I'd love to, to pray with you. I know Kelly would too. Because we can't do this life without God. We can't do this life without one another. And the call to God is to press into one another, but yet in the presence of his spirit. So let us move forth from this place in his truth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. people said.